Hi, it's Paul Bayes with GreatDad.com, and I'm here on my, with my weekly series of conversations with dads who hopefully will add to our knowledge. And I've got a guest today. I can't say that I'm excited. Like I usually say, I'm really excited about this conversation, but it's a necessary conversation. Today, we're talking with Daryl Rogers, who's a family recovery coach, and he's got a personal story that led him to coaching families dealing with children with an addiction, a drug, like I guess usually a drug addiction problem. So welcome, Daryl. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate you having me. So I think this is probably one of the greatest fears that dads have with kids in the house growing up when they hit maybe preteens, teenagers, even more than them discovering porn, which is, you know, the thing that we all worry about too, or being abducted, which is usually a family member being abducted. I never really worried that much about that, but I did worry about bad influences that would lead the kids to drugs or something else in that line. And there were kids in our school who did get tempted and seduced into that world and had really bad outcomes. And you've got a personal story about your own son. And I'd love to, if you could tell that story sure. for our listeners. Sure. So really, he was a good kid growing up. His name is Chase, a really good kid growing up, was diagnosed with ADD, ADHD early on. And so he had some struggles, mostly, you know, I've seen other kids who are ADD. And I would say he was on the lower end of the spectrum, you know, but definitely a little bit of hyperactivity and just a hard time focusing in the classroom and stay focused. So, you know, but other than that, I mean, really good, mild mannered, quiet, easygoing, had kind of a weird sense of humor, had a lot of friends. People loved him, you know, a good athlete. Uh, small but quick, and Chase. Uh, Chase eventually he he got into scouting and and became an Eagle Scout. Wow! So yeah, really good kid. And it was in really his sophomore year of high school that I began noticing some changes in Chase. Well, this is really tough for parents because I can tell you that uh, the changes I was seeing in him, with him being my first teenager, my first child. I didn't, didn't really know what to expect. Right, right, right. And so I attributed it, at least in the beginning, to this is just what teenage boys go through sometimes, you know, just right. that they're more private. process. They're suddenly yeah. they're private. They're not spending much time with you. But you chalk that off to like, oh, this is a natural separation and it's going to happen. And Yeah. Yeah. And it was really, it was just, you know, his grades were beginning to drop. All oh. Of a sudden. Yeah. And he was failing one class and he had always been, he, was not, he wasn't a stellar student, but he'd always been a slightly above average. And now he's failing a class. He was becoming a little bit rebellious in his, the way he dressed and the way he behaved at home. And, and, you know, I caught him in some lies and he would never lie when he was a kid, even if it, he knew it was going to get him in trouble. So it was just, man, this is just so uncharacteristic of him. What's going on? And I had a, I have a military background and I felt like with his other challenges with the ADD, ADHD, I felt like a structured environment that a military school would offer might be good for him. And the other thing was I was trying to get him away from girls a little bit. <laughs> because that was becoming a big distraction for him. And so I, he transferred in the middle of his uh, junior year to a military school. And, you know, the other school that he was at, he was a good athlete, but he was getting overlooked a little bit, bigger school. Now he's a, a once he transferred, he was a bigger fish in a smaller pond. So he had a really outstanding senior year of football there with high school and he got his grades back on track he still had some bumps in the road in terms of his behavior while he was there at that school but he did graduate and there was a, a small school small uh, college that offered him some scholarship money to attend there and play football for them that was out of state and uh, he headed off there and uh, unfortunately, it wasn't long after he arrived there that he began to hang out with people who were abusing drugs and alcohol. And pretty but soon so he it, was... Did you have a feeling this had started back in high school at the original school and then it was kind of somewhat under control? And Yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, he told his mother that he didn't start until he got to the military school and it was just a little bit of experimentation, mostly with alcohol at military school. But you know, I don't know if that's true or not, because the behavior changes really started back at the other high school. And 
I, I know a little bit more now about some of the other people he was hanging out with there. So I think it really probably started there and uh, just began to escalate. And then when he got to college, he didn't have anybody looking over his shoulder anymore. He's out of state. Mom and dad aren't there. He's not at the military school. There's nobody to check up on him. And he had this freedom that he didn't have before. And uh, it didn't take long. By the second semester of his freshman year, he dropped out, came back home, and immediately gravitated to a rough crowd back here at home. He would be gone for days at a time. I wouldn't know where he was. He would not communicate with us. We would try to call or text and nothing. And he moved out at one point. I was keeping up with him through his social media posts. And he was not a big kid to begin with. But now he's losing weight rapidly. You know, I can see in the pictures, he's very pale, glassy-eyed. I see pictures of him. It looks like he's in a hotel room with a bunch of other kids, and they're just kind of laying all over the bed like they're, you know, it looks like they're all strung out on drugs, you know. And it was a scary thing to see that. And so I, the word intervention just popped into my head. Because I, I'm in that mode at this point where I got to do something to save my son's life. And I didn't know anything about an intervention, but I had just come across the show a couple of times. There used to be a reality show about an intervention on, on TV and never really watched it. Just enough of it to get the idea. I knew what it was about. And so I began to do Google searches and I found this intervention company I'm in Chicago, and they sent someone to my house. I paid them to send someone to my house to uh, help me uh, with an intervention for Chase. And we did have an intervention for him, and, and we're successful at getting him into treatment. Um, there's a lot more to that story. It's all a story in and of itself. But he he went to treatment in South Florida, and he was there for, he was in treatment for 30 days and then went to a halfway house and bounced around to several different halfway houses there in South Florida, spent a total of about nine months there, came back home and was doing a lot better, got a job and just working in retail, but it was his first job, you know, and he was staying away from the people who had been a bad influence before. And now he was a, he was going to IOP, intensive outpatient care, like group therapy two nights a week. And they would drug test in there, you know. And so he was doing a lot better. But uh, as the months went by, he, he began to relapse. And uh, I didn't know anything about addiction at the time. And I, but I could tell something was off. And he finally came to me one day and he said, Dad, you know, I'm headed in a bad direction again. I said, I know. <laughs> He said, I'm hanging around a rough crowd. I need to get away from these people, and I don't know how to accept a move. And he told me I've taken a job transfer to Florida back to the area where I was in treatment. He'd already made living arrangements there. Told me when he was planning to leave. I told my wife, Kim, and she made Chase promise he would come by and have a meal with us before leaving for Florida. Well, the day came he was supposed to come by and eat with us, and he didn't show up. It's getting later in the afternoon. We're sitting around talking in the living room. And, um, about that time I had a phone call from a friend and I went outside to have my phone conversation and I'm out in the front lawn. Uh, it was May 29th, 2014. And I'm talking to my friend on the phone and a police cruiser pulled up to the curb in front of our house. And it was an officer coming to tell me that, that there had been a bad wreck and a chase had died at the scene. And the wreck really happened only a few miles from our house, probably less than five miles from where we live. I'm sure it's less than five miles, maybe closer. But anyway, you know, we, I invited the police officer in. He came in with me to break the news to my family. I, I gave them the news, but he came in as support. And we, he didn't have a lot of answers that day as to the details of what happened. But as we, things went on, we began to find out that uh, there'd been a, a going away party the night before that Chase and some of his friends attended and they got really messed up and all kind of drugs and alcohol served there. And then the next day they woke up late feeling hung over and they decided to go to a part near a home and they all smoked marijuana there to help them cope with their nausea. That yeah. was the idea. And then uh, Chase let a girl that he had dated at one time, he smoked with them, get behind the wheel of his car. He got in the front passenger seat, and then another kid got in the back, and they left that park and only made it a few miles before she lost control of his car in a curb. 
and he had hit a tree, skidded off the road and hit a tree, and Chase died at the scene. It took about an hour for them to get the other two out of the vehicle. And then the they came home, the, the two survivors returned home and continued their recovery at home. But then seven months after the wreck and just a few weeks prior to what would have been her first court appearance, the girl uh, that had been driving that day uh, died after a fire broke out in her apartment. And the fire chief, they said they believed that she poured gasoline all over the floor of her apartment, stood in the middle of it, and ignited it. There were two suicide notes that were found. So it's a terrible story. It's a tragic story. But it's one that I think parents need to hear and other people out there, teenagers need to hear. Yeah. yeah. Joe, my heart just goes out. I mean, that's the, any parent's worst nightmare is getting that, getting a visit from the police in that circumstance. And that guy. You know, I, I'm sure like everybody else, I don't even know what to say, but I, in that story, I can, I, what I hear, I guess is that probably the same thing that a lot of people would do. It seems like the same steps that I would take. I would, you know, I try to get close to my son or my daughter and talk to them a lot as you did. And, and then eventually go to intervention and go through all the steps and, you know, with the, with all the best intentions, thinking that you could get a handle on this. And I, I know nothing is guaranteed in this life. So. There is that, but it sounds like you did everything that most of us would have intuitively thought, but yet you, you've then kind of, when we talked earlier, said that you made you yourself now realize that you made a lot of mistakes along the way that oh, yeah. you, you wish you'd known. And, and that's part of the reason why you've got this outreach is trying to help other parents. So what in that story is, was incorrect or could have been done in a different way? Yeah. Yeah, there's certainly things I could have done better. I think the intervention was one of the best things that I did right. because it's yeah. sort of a, and, and I don't recommend it for every person in every situation, but in that situation, it was a pattern interrupt for Chase. It got him into treatment. It gave his chance, his brain a chance to heal, gave him a chance to get away from the people who were being a bad influence on him and for him to begin to learn some life skills, you know, that could get some coping skills some healthy coping skills so that he could cope with the stresses of life without having to turn to drugs. I think the first, I guess I would call it a mistake that I made would be that he moved back in with us after treatment. I think that is usually nine times out of 10, I would say that's a mistake for most people mm -hmm. to let your adult child move back in with you at home after treatment. Because it, it sounds like such a, like, the totally appropriate thing to do, right? Yeah, you would think it would be the right thing to do, right? But the thing is that there are a lot of underlying causes to addiction. And, you know, for whatever reason, the person who is battling addiction, when life stresses come up, and we all have to deal with stress every day in our life as adults, but when those life stresses come up, they are... They're looking for a way to cope with those stresses. They don't have the healthy coping mechanisms that we have. They've not developed those. And so when they go to treatment, they're learning some of those things. But it, depending on how long the treatment program is, and most of them are only 30 days because that's what insurance will pay for. I like to recommend longer programs, you know, like a one-year program when possible. But, but you know... Even then, they need time to gradually work their way back into, you know, transitioning into being an independent adult and being able to gradually learn how to cope with those stresses. As they move right back into the, to the family unit and the family, if they've not been doing their homework, they don't understand addiction. They can do things or say things that will trigger that that person, their son or daughter uh, battling addiction into a relapse. And it's unintentional. And they have the best, the parents have the best intentions, but those just those stresses, they're stresses that are just automatic anyway. You know, it's just part of family life. They're not we're going to agree all the time on everything. And when those stresses come up, you know, it's just a recipe for relapse. Right, right. So that was definitely one thing I would have done different. So in your experience, uh, it sounds like there are a lot of factors here. I don't know if the ADHD or that played any role at all, but bad influences, opportunity, potentially, I guess, potentially genetic dis disposition to addiction. I think, you know, I think there are probably a lot of parents. I mean, I, I was one, I drank alcohol in 
in high school, starting maybe in sophomore year. And I smoked marijuana at the end of my, my senior year and through, you know, some in college as well. But, uh, and, and I think a lot of parents, especially of our age, maybe went through those years in the, you know, the seventies and eighties where things were a lot more casual in terms of drinking and availability get alcohol, especially if you lived in a rural area, which I did, but there wasn't a lot going on. So we kind of based parenthood thinking like some of this experimentation would be normal and okay, because you kind of know, hey, they're going to do it. And how can you stop it? What did you go through some of that thinking at first or what, how, what, 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 what was your thinking about that? A little bit, but I'm different from a lot of parents in that I had a very strict, right. loving family upbringing, you know, and my dad was a Southern Baptist preacher, you know, yeah. and so be, coming up as a preacher's kid like that, it was just, I had some very strong opinions about any drug use at that point. So, uh, you know, I was, I'd probably have a different, maybe an overreaction compared to a lot of parents. The thing that I would say that parents need to be a little bit aware of is, you know, going back to, I came, I was growing up in the seventies, you know, sixties yeah. and seventies. And I remember those days and, and the drugs are different now. So yeah. even the marijuana is so much more potent and there's different ways of consuming it. And parents need to understand that it's not the marijuana that it was. Right. You know, then not even close. And it, it tends to go, it tends to start out with you know, alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana, and then, you know, it goes on to other things. But I think there is a correlation with ADHD and I don't, or ADD. Um, I, I don't know what the correlation is exactly. I have some ideas, uh, but there does seem to be a high percentage of kids who are battling addiction who, um, have been diagnosed ADHD. Hmm. I wonder if that's par part of once they've been told that, that they think that there may be drugs that will compensate for that lack of ability to focus or the hyperactivity or whatever. And they think it might, it, and it probably does calm them and, and it, you know, versus just getting for the entertainment value, they're, they're thinking that maybe this is going to really help them deal with their ADHD or ADD. They can be a little bit, what's the word I'm looking for here? Impulsive. Yeah. It can be impulsive. So they don't really think things through as much as other kids might, you know, I mean, that's a normal teenage thing anyway, because the brain's still developing, you know, the frontal lobe, but, but they may be a little bit more impulsive. And then the other things that come up, I think the, maybe the medication, you know, the medication, depending on which medication they were using and how strong it is, because like in Chase's case, he was, he played football. He wasn't real big. He wanted to get bigger. And the ADHD meds suppressed his appetite some. So I know he came off of it in college and then he started with other drugs, you know? So yeah, there, there is that possibility. I can't say for sure, but there does seem to be some correlation there. Yeah. I, I wonder also once they, a lot of kids are now taking Adderall, even if they don't need it. And that's yeah. oh, some yeah. cases for the high achievers, that's their first experimentation with drugs because they're using it to reach higher levels of achievement, trying to get that 4.5 or whatever it is, a great point average that they're trying to do. And that could potentially lead to it too. I Shifting gears a little bit, we talked mm -hmm. before about the, the fact that some of this drug abuse or addiction can start as early as preteen now in some communities. Yeah. And I mean, I struggle with this, I'm sure as almost all parents do, how invasive do you want to be with your kids? Do you want to go through their drawers when they're not around? Do you want to get into their social media? Do you want to break into their phones or have free access to their phones? Do, do you want to be that kind of parent who is naturally right. suspicious when weighing that against the safety and protection of your kids? Do you have advice on how to navigate that? Yeah. You know, the internet was still young to some extent when my, when Chase was going through this, you know, compared to now, but it was a little bit different. And so I wasn't as prepared. I wasn't as prepared as I should have been, you know, having kids have access to it. So, um, the one thing I would say is that you as a parent, when you're dealing with a preteen or a teen, you as a parent, you're providing the, you're paying for the service. You're paying for the internet service or the cell service. You're paying for the phone or the other devices they're using. 
it's yours. You have control over that. But then there needs to be a clear understanding up front. So I would delay as long as possible giving them those devices and try to keep them engaged in a lot of physical activities and outdoors and things like that, particularly with boys. Also, once you go down that path, I think it's a really good idea to have a written contract with an agreement spelled out and have them read through it. Here, you want this phone? Well, here it is, but these are the stipulations. And one of the stipulations is, yeah, I mean, they're under 18. You really have a responsibility as a parent to protect them from certain things. So you're going to need to check their chat and everything. But that needs to be understood up front so, so, so that you're not spying. Yeah. And when they get, when they become a little bit older and the toothpaste is already out of the tube, so to speak, they're already using those devices. I think that it's, yeah, you can't spy on you. It's too, it breaks the trust too much. It's not a good idea to, to spy, but definitely early on and while they're still living at home and while they're still using those devices that you're paying for at home, I think that it's fine. You just need to have that understanding up front, have it clear. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. I, with best of intentions, that was what we were going to do. And we never got around to it, never got the contract done, never did. Got, you know, at first we kind of knew their passwords, but they changed them. You mm-hmm. know, so and they, they do pass through this part where they are very private and it's very hard to break through. And you also know that even if you are snooping on all their devices, they are very smart and they're far more oh, yeah. savvy than they are. <laughs> if they want to hide something, they're going to hide it. But I, I do think that contract for whether, you know, ideally written down, like you say, where you, they're very specific, what, what you have to do to you have that $500,000 device means, you're, you know, you're going to clean the garage every month or walk the car or whatever, and have that clear rather than this vague idea of, I'm going to give you this thing, you're going to do some other, you know, chores around the house. Right. Uh, and then kind of the implications of what can happen on social media and having that conversation with them is really key. And then you know, having that conversation ongoing with them, what's going on. But it, it sounds like you, you tried a lot of that and it's still a challenge. It's, it is better if you, if you um, create an environment where they feel comfortable coming to you and talking to you about things and uh, that you're not going to just like come down with the, you know, just lower the hammer or lower the boom on them. Um, that you're going to talk to them and, and you begin to treat them more like an adult. They're sort of that whole transition as they're going from childhood to adulthood. They're going through those teenage years. They want to be treated like an adult. So you try to do that to the extent possible. So you begin building that trust a little bit and you begin letting go of control a little bit more and a little bit more so that, you know, they're more likely to come to you and talk to you when something does come up. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, just I think part of that too is the love versus the suspicion and the continuous reiteration that I'm tr- I'm trying to protect you and I and you know that you're the most important thing in the world and all those type of messages rather than I know you're a bad kid. I know you. I hate right. that friend of right. yours who's a jerk and I don't want you sh- seeing him anymore and all that kind of stuff, which does kind of separate out the parent from being a loving parent versus a suspicious seeing the worst in their child. And I can totally relate though. If you see the warning signs, you know, now you're, now you are suspicious. So how do you temper that (laughs) healthy suspicion with being overly, you know, overly protective and turning it into a bad relationship? Yeah. You have to really be careful about that. And, And that's sort of what I did. You know, I really did do that. I mean, it wasn't that it was terrible, but it, it did become an adversarial relationship at points at certain times where I was just overbearing, trying to control things too much. And so I turned it around with our younger son where he and I would butt heads a little bit. And he was much more his, you know, Chase would sort of earlier on would go along with me if he felt if I was pushing him a little bit in a certain direction, whereas his younger brothers, like, no, he would push back. And and I learned, hey, I need to back off of him and let him make some of his own mistakes. And then when I started to do that, it wasn't long before, you know, once he went to college, he was picking up the phone and calling me and saying, hey, dad, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? 
And so he's totally flipped the relationship. He's always been very inquisitive anyway and always asking me questions about things, but it really flipped the relationship. And that's what you want from your kids. You want them, you want to have that relationship where they're asking you for advice versus you trying to tell them what to do. You know, once once they get into their later teens and into adulthood. Yeah. Well, I think there's he has a differentiation here between doing the things that are you know, are, are snooping and trying to figure out what they're doing using uh-huh. other tools versus actually having conversations with your kids all the time. So you have a little bit of a finger on the pulse. Like you, you knew we chase early on, even if he wasn't telling you that there was something wrong something was, yeah, and maybe right. would have done things a little bit differently had you realized how dangerous that was at that point. Yeah. And I, I talk about easier said than done, but I talk about pulling versus pushing, just like with the rope, you know, you can't push a rope very easily, but the, yeah, the, it's, it's more about trying to influence, being a good influence on them and really becoming a good listener. And you can learn how to validate their feelings without agreeing with what they're doing or agreeing with what they're saying. You can become a good listener. And that makes a big difference in the relationship because once you try to once the fear kicks in and you go into control mode and trying to control them, then it, it, it becomes, they're going to push back on that. And the more you push, the more they're going to push back, the more they're likely to go in the other direction. So you really have to work on how can I change the communications here so that I'm influencing instead of trying to control. Right, right. So all this, this experience is tragedy led you to helping other parents and coaching them. Are you coaching more like ahead of the problem or do you focus mostly when somebody in the family has already identified, Hey, I got, I think I've got a issue here and now I need to create a plan to address it. Yeah. I started out coaching before the problem a little bit, and I still do a little of that here and there, but um, when people ask for it, but my primary focus is on uh, coaching parents who uh, already know that their son or daughter has a, a drug or alcohol problem. And, and is part of that learning those listening and communication skills and trying to do it without a, you know, heavy hand? That is part of it. And I think the thing that most parents early on, particularly if they don't have any kind of a, any kind of experience with addiction, the default is to think I'm going to send my kid off to a treatment program and they're going to fix them. And, you know, and that, and and that's it. That's all that needs to be done. And uh, they'll come back home and everything will be great. And, you know, even though I think most people logically know that's not how it's going to work, I think we tend to lean in that direction. And so parents have to learn that there's only one person in the equation they can control and that's themselves. And uh, once they dive into their own personal development, spiritual growth, all of that, and then learn how to be better communicators and learn how to improve all the relationships in the family. If they're doing working on that, particularly if their kid does go to treatment, if they're working on that while their son or daughter's in treatment, when they come back out of treatment, the family is in a much better position to be able to have a positive influence on that addicted child versus because now they know I can't enable because enabling behavior is something that parents tend to get into out of a lot of fear and shame and guilt. They will do things for their son or daughter that they could be and should be doing for themselves. And that's not healthy for the parents or the son or daughter. A lot of rescuing behavior, you know, bailing them out of jail (laughs) when they shouldn't be doing that, uh, like that. And, uh, And me and I have some stories about those kinds of things from parents calling me, but uh, it sounds like you, it sounds like you really need to, to develop a lifelong strategy versus I think naturally as parents, I mean, we've gone through some, you know, some problems, not, nowhere close to what you've gone through, but where there have been hiccups. And as a parent, you just des- so desperately want to just put it back in the box and go back to when they were an innocent child. And that's like yeah. blinders on, you know, on your, on yourself and not wanting to deal with it. So that's not a good thing. 
I, I think a lot of people with money, like you say, they throw money at it and they just send their kid off to yeah. a place else and hope that it, the problem goes away and it's fixed. And then they go back and everybody's the same and it's, you know, happy times again. But what I think I'm hearing you saying is that you need to, as a family, need to understand how bad this is and develop a whole new coping mechanism. Because as we all know from years and years about hearing about Alcoholics Anonymous, that this is, it's not an addiction that you cure it and then it goes away. It's something right. a person going to have to deal with for the rest of their lives. That's right. Yeah. And so the family can be an impetus for change for the addicted person. They can, when the family gets... And everybody thinks, well, there's nothing wrong with me. You know, is my kids the one with the problem? Why do I need to work on myself? But really, you give your child the best opportunity at recovery when you, as the parent, begin to work on yourself and in the all the family dynamics. Because addiction does affect the entire family. But the other part of that is what you just really touched on is that the family is so stressful on the whole family that it can destroy a family. Yeah. So regardless of what happens with your child, you know, it can, it puts stress on the marriage, it puts stress on your other family relationships, and it can just pull a family apart. So you need to work on that just to get stronger, to be able to weather the storm. And there's always the possibility that your child could die. We hope that's not going to happen. We're going to do everything. When, if you're working with me, I'm going to do everything I can to put all the strategies in place to try to prevent that. But Sometimes there's nothing we can do to prevent it, you know, and, and so you need to be strong enough that you can weather that storm as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you at your website, DarylRogers.com, and you can uh, D-A-R-Y-L-R-O-D-G-E-R-S.com, yeah. or you can also search for Renewed Hope Family Recovery Coaching, which is longer, but maybe easier to remember. We'll put that in the show notes. You do offer some services. I know you have a, a 55 module course. That's online. That's, I guess, self, self-paced. Yes. Goes through the elements of this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it sort of maps out a roadmap, if you will, for families to, to recover as a family unit from this. And there's all the strategies that you need to know, the things that you need to know if you're early on in the process, the things that you can do to help your loved one, your son or daughter who's battling addiction, but also the strategies you put in place to help the whole family. I do have another site. I'm kind of shifting, but I've got two or three sites out there I know right now. But my main one that I'm moving to is thefamilyrecoverycoach.com. Okay. So people can find me there. There are there is a free book download on my other site, DarylRogers.com. This is a story of my son's life, and they can download a copy of that book there. That that book is has had a lot of downloads. This is a probably forty thousand downloads over the years. And it people have all over the world have reached out to me, have read that book. I was still very angry in the early stages of grief when I wrote it, and it's it's really raw. I didn't understand addiction, but for whatever reason, it's resonated with a lot of people. So anyway, that's available. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so the, the, the course, the online course, the self-guided course is 55 lessons. It's $37. Yeah. I know you recently, it's, there's a lot in there and you recently just released, uh, you reduced the price dramatically because you want to make sure people get those resources and yeah. doing it self-guided is obviously the most efficient way. Uh, you also do, you also do coaching. I think you said you have a one year program for the, and this is really for moms and dads, parents who are going through this and who need support, not from a therapist, but from more from a coaching angle, which is right. a different orientation. Therapists deal more with trauma. Coaches deal more with how do you move forward? How do you, how do you not, how do you cope, but how do you work through it? How do you, what steps you put in place? Yeah. I'm really intrigued by that because I, I, people must feel totally alone during this process and need that, not only the coaching, but the group coaching and the support that you could get in that situation. Just the way the same do like Al-Anon, you know, supports yeah. families of alcoholics because they're going through, you know, their own tragedy and drama as well as the person who's addicted. I do facilitate a PAL group, PAL as Parents of Addicted Loved Ones, and that's a free thing that parents can go join. It's just that I see, and it's a great organization, really good. It's just that I have seen where some parents need more. They need more accountability. They need more in-depth coaching. And so it's really about 
giving them a roadmap, this course, that, or not a course, but the online group coaching program, it, it gives them a roadmap for helping them go through the whole transformation process where they can find joy and fulfillment in life again, regardless of the choices of their son or daughter battling addiction. And at the same time, put their son and, and son or daughter, this battling addiction in the best position possible to be able to recover. And it's just all about family recovery, dealing with the chronic worry, dealing with all of the other emotions and putting some strategies in place and having the accountability and the community there with the other parents. Because a lot of parents, just, they feel they really feel alone in this struggle because they well, can't sure they, talk to their friends or family about it. You know, yeah, They feel shame. They feel competent. They feel like they're a bad parent. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of horrible feelings that are in, even independent of the grief, I'm sure. Oh yeah, for sure. And speaking of grief, they 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 really are grieving over their son or daughter while they're still alive because they've lost their son or daughter the way that they knew them, the way that they raised them, the way they're behaving is like somebody they don't know. And it's just not the same. And they, they're already sort of in a grieving process in sort of an anticipatory grief too. And they're fearful about where things are headed. And so that's just another whole set of emotions that have to be dealt with. Having gone through that myself and having dealt with the grieving process that came after, you know, we lost our son, I have developed some tools that will help parents get through that. Well, I'm sure part of this whole thing is this feeling of powerlessness and, you know, key to it is understanding where you have control, where you don't have control and making yeah. peace with that. I and mean, it's an, you know, age old maximum about learning what you can control and what you can't and getting used to both those dynamics. Yeah. That often really takes the help of somebody else and other people's experiences to get to that, to get to that place, I'm sure. Yeah. And I would, it's a muscle that you build, you know, and so it takes time and it's like, I was just telling somebody just yesterday in a conversation, yeah, you, it's a process. You need accountability and the things that you need to do a lot of times, intuitively, you know you need to be doing some of these things, but you need accountability because you need to, it's not going to feel good at first. You're going to say, well, I know I need to do that, but I don't feel like doing it today. Yeah. You know, just like going to the gym, <laughs> but you know you need to go. Right? But once you go, then you feel better. Right. And that's where the accountability really comes in, you know. Yeah. Well, like my example of the contract for the phone. I mean, if I had, had been in coaching at that time and had somebody say, you know, are you going to do that next week? And I, you know, right, right. definitely would have rather than saying, Hey, that's a great idea. And getting all those warm, fuzzy feelings that I'm the type of person who would do that, though I don't follow it through. Mm. And that's part of the magic of coaching along with a lot of other things is that accountability yeah. component. That is a big there, piece of it. Daryl, I, again, I really, is a very sad story that you've told, I'm sure a lot of people can understand it on some level because it's fear that we all have. And I, I, if there's anything good out, coming out of it is that, that you're able to talk to other parents and help them through this and understand the danger signs of some of the things that you learned along the way. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's always healing for me. And this has been part of the healing process for me is being able to tell my son's story kind of keep his memory alive. I talk about the good parts, you know, we didn't have time to get into a lot of that today, but, but, you know, it's a way of keeping his memory alive. And at the same time, being able to help other people who are going through this. And it's just, it's healing for me because of the feedback that I get from other people, you know, and all, all the love that I feel from the people who are hearing the story, you know, it's just healing. So. All right. So you can find Daryl, put in the show notes so you can find with all those URLs. Okay. <laughs> Paul Vance at greatdad.com. I've got a course on gratitude that you can get for a dollar. For, just for listeners of this podcast, if you go to greatdad.com slash courses and you'll see the course on, on gratitude and you put the, the uh, code in podcast one and it'll be just a dollar, $38 a month. So with that said, I'll sign off for this week with my guest, Daryl Rogers. Until next time, hold your kids close and try to be the best, best dad you can be. See you next time.